Okay, good morning. I guess most of the people are here, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Noah Silverman, and I want to talk briefly about trading with Bitcoins and some of the statistical properties of the market that I've seen. Really quickly, who the heck am I? Uh, I founded a couple of dot-coms back in the day. I now have a master's in statistics, and uh, I'm actually one paper short of a PhD in statistics. Uh, I work with financial models and portfolio management and machine learning and all sorts of fun stuff and discovered Bitcoins a few months ago, and I'm fascinated by the market. There are some really, really unique properties to Bitcoins that you don't see in traditional financial markets, besides the fact it's one of the fastest growing assets around, and it's, uh, it's exciting. Um, I'm starting a new blog, btcmath.com, where I'm going to start posting articles every week or two just sort of about this type of stuff. And uh, I just got asked to publish a column in the Wilmot Journal of Finance. They publish every two months. And, I'm going to be writing about cryptocurrencies in general, not just Bitcoins. Uh, a couple rules for this talk. Uh, when you deal with a large amount of data, there's a million ways to interpret it, so you sort of have to have some guidelines. We're going to treat Bitcoins only as a liquid trading asset. We're going to ignore their use in transactions and overthrowing governments and you know, all the other fun stuff. We're just going to treat it as an asset. I'm going to use Mt. Gox data, mainly because it's the most liquid exchange right now and it's sort of the largest, easiest source of data to get. I completely recognize there are other exchanges and other sources of trading, but we're just going to look at Mt. Gox for now. All prices are in U.S. dollars, and yes, you could have just bought Bitcoins and hoarded them and sat on them and made a ton of money. We're not going to look at that. We're going to look at what you could do if you wanted to trade them and how the market behaves. If it was just holding them, there'd be no point to this talk. Again, why Mt. Gox? There's live tick data. There's a full order book available. Uh, they have a really nice streaming API that's free and open to everyone. Uh, in general, with financial data, it tends to get very expensive if you want high-frequency data. Most of the trading platforms are not going to show you all the trades, and they're not going to show you the full order book. Mt. Gox makes it all available for free, mainly because there's just not that much volume yet, so it's easy to do. So now, with a laptop, anybody has access to data that normally professional traders on Wall Street would spend a ton of money for. So again, it makes it interesting. Uh, I discovered a nice tool that I want to suggest, and I have no relation to the, to the author at all, but it's called Gox Tool. It's written in Python, and he's already done all the heavy lifting of connecting to the Mt. Gox streams, hooking into your account, um, getting all the streaming trades, plotting them to the screen, and there actually are empty functions right in there in Python for every event. A change in the order book, a trade happens, a tick update, there's just blank functions. So you can plug in whatever crazy strategies you have and see what happens but it makes life really easy. I did not use that for the analysis we're going to do in this talk, but I'm developing small, developing small rhythmic trading stuff of my own, and most of it's built around that tool. And again, it's open source. Just Google it. There's a Git page for it. What do we know about Bitcoins? In a way, it's really wisdom of the crowd. It's the only asset I can think of where the true value is really just what people think it is. If I buy a Bitcoin from you for $100, I guess they're $123 right now, that means it's worth slightly more than $123 to me, and it's worth slightly less than $123 to you, or we wouldn't trade. So there's no regulatory rules, there's no underlying corporate profits or mining of actual gold or assets or things like that. One of the interesting challenges is there's no derivatives. I know some exchanges are working on it, but there's nothing sort of large yet. Uh, there's no debt, so there's no interest rate, there's no bonds, there's no loans, there's no trading on margin. Uh, there's no correlated assets. Yes? Excuse me? Somebody's starting. Yes, thank you. Somebody's, it, it, oh, I'm sure all this will change in the next three months. It's all coming quickly. Um, there are no correlated assets, uh, and there's no index funds. And why these things are interesting is that with traditional trading, there's a lot of strategies that depend on these things. Uh, you know, the future value of something is usually done through what's called a discounted cash flow where you're going to look at the interest rate if you just kept the money or invested it and made interest versus what you would get from the asset. You'll frequently look at hedging things where you're offloading some risk by balancing your investment in bitcoins versus some other currency that's correlated to it, hopefully negatively correlated, so when one goes up, the other goes down. Um, you can't do that. Often there are index funds where they'll put together a basket of assets and you can invest in the basket, again, to offload some risk. can't do that with bitcoins. It's really just a pure asset. For the libertarians in the group, it's a fantastic thing. So then the question is, should we even bother with all this? You know, can we trade Bitcoins? Do we care? What if we just you know, hoard them and sit on them? Um, you know, so there's some questions. Whenever I look at these type of projects, we want to look. Is the market efficient? 
Uh, if it's an efficient market, that means things are priced exactly where they should be, so there's no advantage in trading it. Uh, you know, can we identify any kind of trends? How volatile is the market? Is there periodicity, which means things tend to have patterns over time? Does the time frame matter? You know, five minutes, 30 minutes, hour, day, that type of thing. Uh, because we have individual trades, but we might want to slow down the time frame and how does that affect things? And lastly, what's the fee structure like? Every exchange takes commission. You might find a fantastic strategy that makes you a half a percent profit every time. But if the exchange is going to charge you more than a half a percent to then buy and sell, it's still a losing strategy. So unfortunately, fees really put a cap on what we can do. So what did I do? We took Mt. Gox data. We have trades from January 1st till April 10th. And that's actually a little wrong. Uh, just this morning, I grabbed some more trades so that we're current up to today. Uh, we rounded to the nearest penny because Mt. Gox allows you to trade US dollars in some infinitesimal fraction that's, I think, a little ridiculous. And I'm using some statistical software called R that if you're not a statistician, at some point it's worth looking at because it has a lot of really nice tools built in for data analysis. First thing I want to look at is how often does this thing trade? And we're looking at trades per minute. And you can see most minutes have, you know, one trade, two trades. You rarely see more than 15 or 20 trades per minute on Mt. Cox, and that's current up through uh, midnight of last night. So then we sort of stretch the time frame and we say, well, what kind of trades are we looking at per hour? And, you know, 100 and change is the, you know, sort of the median trades per hour, uh, trades per day. Uh, there were a few crazy outliers. If you look, you'll see we had a few days with 40,000 trades. There were a few days with 60,000 trades. I don't know the dates of those, but I would guess it's during the big run up or the big run down when all the volume piled in and Mt. Gox slowed down for a bit. Here's a nice graph. We're looking at trades per hour over time. In other words, are people trading more per hour over the last year? And you'd expect it to just go straight up as Bitcoin gets more popular, but you'll see we actually had a little peak in September, and it's still really noisy here. It's, you know, the average trades per hour is jumping all over the place. It's not, it's not a direct trend yet. Hang on. And trades per day, it's also an interesting pattern. It is trending up, which is nice. To me, this shows that Bitcoin trading is sort of growing in popularity. Although the last two or three days, it's dropped off. And the only thing I can guess is because we're all here, and no one's actually trading. I'd be really curious to see what happens to the volume on Monday morning when everyone goes home with all their new ideas and dives in and starts buying more Bitcoins. So the other thing we look at, and I should have, actually this slide is a little out of order, is we look at returns. When you're trading, you don't care what the asset costs. You care about your percentage profit. I don't care if a Bitcoin's a dollar or a Bitcoin's a million dollars. I care, did I make 5% profit, 10% profit? So we tend to take away the price and just look at the percentage change and it, it's one of the things we want to look at is, are the returns trending over time? And the answer is really not much. Question. Yes? Are you calculating returns based on the next tick? Or are you calculating, I mean, you're not actually looking at the rate. These are looking at the close of five minute periods. We, you can do tick to tick returns, but what you're picking up then is uh, bid ask bounce and market microstructure noise. So I look at the, I'm actually looking at returns in different time periods. You can see this big crazy part here, and that's exactly when we had the run up and the run down. But the returns themselves over a five minute period, eh, you're not really seeing more than about a 1% change in any five minute period. So again, we, we scale up to hourly and we start looking at daily returns and this is where you can start to see really clearly the, the real noisy days. Uh, the other thing we wanna look at is volatility, which is basically the, the variance of the returns or how much they're jumping around from the mean. And you can see volatility tends to happen in clusters and this is behavior you'll see in traditional markets where basically it's mass panic. When lots of people start trading, then lots of other people start trading and the price starts jumping around. The price is really calm, nobody's making big moves and the price tends to stay calm. Some people have developed trading strategies just around predicting volatility and trying to take advantage of that. And again, you'll see the price was all over the place um, you know, when we had the, the big run up and the big run down. Uh, it's another way of looking at vol is volatility as sort of graphed as a function of returns. And looking at hourly, you don't see much of a trend. It's sort of as you would expect. Looking at daily, you actually see some interesting things where as things get more volatile, it tends to be more of an upward move than a downward move. And that would make sense because the price of Bitcoin has been rising. So if it was completely symmetric, the price of Bitcoin wouldn't have changed. So on a daily basis, the more volatile days tend to close at a higher price. That may be a strategy you can use if you want to start trading this stuff. Now. 
when we talk about returns, we look at log returns. And it's something commonly done on Wall Street, and it makes the math really, really simple. And the difference is so small that nobody cares. And basically, a traditional return is the price now minus the price last period divided by the price last period. It's the percentage change. The math is slow. If you take the log of all the prices, you just subtract. And what's nice is if I want the return over a 30-minute period, and I have 31-minute measurements, you can just add them up. You don't have to do any division. You don't have to do any exponents. It makes life easy. So we tend to look at log returns, and the formula for it is here. It's just the log of the price at time one minus the log of the price at time t minus one. It's a small metric, but good to get comfortable with because it's how most of the finance world looks at things. And I'm looking at the behavior of the returns. You know, the mean return, the median is really a better measure here because the returns are not normally distributed. And I want to look at the range, you know, 30 minutes, hours, daily, sort of what's the max return, what's the min return. And then skew and kutarsis are two fancy statistical terms for what's the shape of the curve. If things are normally distributed, which is that nice bell curve everyone's seen everywhere that I don't have a plot of, um, you're going to skew a skew of zero and a kurtosis of three. So what this tells me is it's leaning a little bit to the side, so the returns are not symmetric. And the really high kurtosis numbers means you have these super long tails, meaning that most of your trades are very, very small, or most of your periods, whether it's hourly or daily, but you see these random massive jumps. And the probability of the massive jump is higher than you would expect. So in other words, random trucks are going to come out of nowhere and just run you over when you least expect it, both positive and negative. Um, and you'll notice as you slow down, as you look at the daily rate, the kurtosis is much, much smaller, so there's less random events. Now, we want to look at whether the market's efficient. Because as I mentioned earlier, if the market's efficient, there's no point in trading this. Louis Bochelier was a mathematician in the 1900s who invented some of the ways to do this. And I'm not going to get into all the math here. We don't have enough time. But just as an overview, the, the general formula is there. And if you Google his runs formula, you can see how. And we're looking at the number of positive runs, as in trades in an order where the price moves up, and the negative, ne negative runs where you know, trades in order when the price moves down, and the probability of seeing those. Because if the market was perfectly efficient, there'd be even probability of up or down. It's like flipping a coin. And sure, you could get a couple of heads in a row or a couple of tails in a row, but you'd average out. And this z-score is a measure of how abnormal it is. If it's abnormal, that's good. We can predict it. And you can see these are huge numbers, which means the probability of it being normally is, you know, one out of a billion. Once you get down to, to 24 hours, that's actually a fairly low z-score, meaning that those returns are, are, are pretty normal and fairly efficient. So trading 24 hours just based on some market efficiency is probably not ideal. There's another test. It's called the random walk test that Loa McKinley put together in 1988. And you're basically looking at this ratio. And the closer it is to one, the less opportunities there are or the more efficient the market is. And it sort of matches the other test. On the smaller time frames, things are bouncing around pretty randomly, which may mean there's some opportunity depending on your strategy. Uh, in a 24-hour period, things are pretty balanced. Uh, another thing we want to look at is what's called an autoregressive integrated moving average. You can look for trends in the time series. And I'll explain a little bit of the math. You're basically saying, you know, the price now, can I say that every price is 10% of the price before it, is it 10% of the price before it minus you know, 0.2 times the price two periods behind or three periods behind. You're looking for trends in the data. And you're looking at moving averages, multiple moving averages over different time periods. You're looking at multiple spacing of prices. And again, the math you can, you can Google if you want to get into it. But looking at these numbers, in a sense, it's telling us that there's really, this strategy does not fit very well. You can't sort of tease out a, a predictable formula for what the price is going to be five minutes from now based on the historical prices. There's no real trending that you can pick up. The last thing I want to look at is what's called a MACD, moving average convergence divergence. I wasn't going to do this, but tons of people on the uh, forums have been playing with some basic versions of this, and there's been a lot of threads about it. And I thought, let's, let's do an actual experiment. Let's study this thing and see if there's, really, if there's a there there or it's not there. Now, a MACD is an interesting idea. You take two moving averages, and moving averages where you're updating the price every time period. Uh, and you look at the difference. You have one moving average that moves very fast. In other words, it's sensitive to the most recent change. And one moving average that's very sort of long and slow. And you, the idea is if the fast one's going up over the slow one, then maybe the prices are trending up, and you should start to buy. The problem with these is usually by the time you see it, it's too late. 
the price has already gone up. And there's this issue of lag. And you can see, you know, here's a nice example. When you know, the lines cross right here, the price keeps going up. The problem is in the real world, you'll never see this. You always see it looking backwards, not looking forward. We're going to use something called an exponential moving average. It's a tool I suggest everyone gets familiar with. You basically decide on a weight or a number of periods for moving average, and it tails off the weight of previous trades or previous time periods sort of endlessly. They just get smaller and smaller and smaller, sort of down to infinity. But you don't have to just say the last three trades, the last four trades, because your, your moving average gets real jumpy. So an exponential moving average smooths things out, and the formula for that's here. It's your moving average, it's a weight lambda of your, moving, of your last moving average, and then the other side, one minus that weight times your current price, and lambda is just two over the number of bars, minutes, days, whatever, plus one. So I played around with a few numbers, and a lot of people seem to like 10 and 21 on the forums. I think Clark Moody has a live streaming Bitcoin page, I'm sure a lot of you have seen, and he plots some of those. So I, I use those for this experiment. In the real world, you would try thousands of combinations and see which one did better. You know, maybe it's 11 and 22, maybe it's 15 and 57, who knows. The other thing you want to look at is what's called lag, meaning if I see the moving average just cross right now, how long do I wait before I sell this thing or before I buy this thing or, you know, expect the, the price to change? Because if I see the moving average now, do I, am I looking 10 minutes ahead to make my money, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, et cetera? And I decided to look at a lag of 30 periods of whatever time frame it is. So if it's minutes, it's 30 minutes ahead. If it's days, it's 30 days ahead. And we sort of want to plot this signal, which is the difference between the moving averages, and, and see how it behaves. So the first thing, and this slide's going to load really slow, I think. Oops. I just lost my, uh... Joe, can you put the uh, full page back on? We just lost it. Perfect. OK. So while this is drawing slowly, uh, there we go. What we're looking at is the signal, which is the difference between those two moving averages and looking at the return 30 steps out. So these are five minute bars. So we're looking at 35 minute bars out and what we're, what we're basically seeing, these dots are all the times we sampled and I'm plotting the trend, is the signal goes higher, your, the price, the return of your profit is higher 30 periods out. So it's a potential candidate for trading. There's something there. But is five minutes the best? Maybe we want 10 minutes, maybe we want 30 minutes. So let's look at a 30 minute chart and see Looks like it's getting a little higher at the other end, but not as good. And then if we start looking at hourly charts, it gets really steep, which is nice. And then daily, it's kind of a mess. In fact, if anything, daily, if you could short Bitcoins, is a signal goes negative, um, you know, the returns are negative. So if you were shorting it, that would be profit. And it sort of matches what we saw earlier. You know, the days are pretty efficient based on the other measures. So predicting the close of the day is pretty hard. When you get into the smaller time frames, you know, five minutes, 30 minutes, hourly, there's, there's some room to work in there and there may be some more strategies. So now what? You know, the MACD is promising, but you really need to do a lot more study and you'd want to build this thing and test it just trading on paper going forward for, you know, a month and see how it looks and you'd want to play with different lags and different time periods and so on to see what's better. The other problem is transaction fees, and it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. They're too high right now. Each, if you buy something, it's considered a round trip because you have to buy it and then you have to sell it to make a profit. Mount Gox at their basic level, it's 0.6% to buy and then it's another 0.6% to sell, so it's 1.2% round trip. Well, if Bitcoin's trading at 100 bucks, that's $1.20 you know, is what you're paying for each Bitcoin. If you have a strategy that's only going to make you three quarters of a percent or even one percent, you're losing money because of the fees. Uh, there's a few other exchanges I just Googled to see. Intersango has one of the best commission structures I've seen, and they have what are called make or taker fees, meaning if you're offering a price, you pay a lower commission. If you're taking somebody else's offer that's already out there, you're paying a higher commission. And it sort of reward people for offering up bitcoins or dollars for sale and injecting liquidity into the market. That's actually how it's done in more traditional exchanges. So it gets down to 0.3% or 0.35, which is nice because then there's some room to make some profit. BTCE is charging 0.2% on each side, so that's not bad either. But from what I understand, it's really hard to get cash in and out of their exchange since you have to wire it to Russia. Um, and then Bitstamp's taking a half a percent on each side, and they'll slide it. If you want to invest 150K, then you're only paying 0.2%. So whenever you do these trading strategies, you have to look at what your profit is per each turnaround and what the exchange fees are going to eat out of that. 
And then if you're obeying the rules and paying taxes, you have to pay tax on your profit. So that's going to take another bite out of this thing. So you need to do some more study. Don't just throw up a MACD strategy and start tossing your money at it. You'll be surprised. Now, from what I understand, a lot of exchanges are going to start offering options and futures soon, and that will open up a lot more interesting models for trading and hedging and doing interesting things. Um, you know, the structure and the rules and the fees are unknown. Um, most derivatives, you need an interest rate, or what's called a risk-free rate, in order to value them. And right now, Bitcoins, there is no interest and there's no debt, which is one of the really nice things, but it makes a mess of a lot of the financial equations. And so I'm curious to see how they're going to work around that, or if they're going to work around it. And there's something called a naked shorter call that's very hard to regulate. I can sell you the option to buy Bitcoins from me for Bitcoins that maybe I don't have right now. So how do they regulate that? And they're going to have to, they're going to require me making deposits and anonymity is going to go out the window. There's going to be credit checks and things like that. So it's going to restrict some of the things people like about Bitcoins in order to participate. That's all I have for today. So I want to open the thing up to questions and um, I'm here. I also have business cards, and if anybody wants to talk afterwards, thank you. Hi there, my name is Marco from Bitcoin Britain. Just a quick question. Have you tried removing the times when Mt. Gox had a denial of service, where we suspect that that's based on manipulating the price? So if you remove those periods and then play that through your figures again? It's a very good point, and no, I have not. Although interestingly, and I actually put an article on my blog, I didn't have time to put it in the presentation. I found when I was collecting this data, my software sort of went haywire at midnight and I thought something was wrong with it. In a nine minute period, somebody rammed 3,300 trades in Bitcox, Bitcox four, like one Satoshi each at the exact same price. And the total, they spent a nickel, but they were obviously trying to DOS the exchange or trying to game it. It didn't look like it, it crashed anything. But it was fascinating to observe, you know, 3,000 trades come pumping and all at once at the exact same price. Uh, I wrote a little, there's a graph and a little thing about it on my blog. But you're right, we need to take that out if we're going to get thorough. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, will you be putting your slides on lanyard.com or somewhere um, else? Yeah, I'll make them available wherever, wherever the, the conference has them. Sure. And Thanks. again, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Thanks. <clears throat> Do you know why there's like a 7% difference in the price between Mt. Gox and BTCE? I have a guess. There's a concept in finance, if you take a finance 101 class, called no free lunch. And the idea is, you know, there's no arbitrage. The world's supposed to be fair. And I actually looked just the other day at, hey, I should arbitrage this thing. I should send money to Russia, buy the Bitcoins cheap, you know, transfer them to Mt. Gox, sell them, and I'll get rich. Well, if you look at the cost of the fees of sending the money to Russia, you look at the percentage that BTCE takes coming in, you look at the percentage that Mt. Gox is going to charge me for taking it out, and it's just about even. So it pretty much eats its sort of imbalance. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I, can, I can actually answer what you said is very accurate. Normally, it's about a 4% cost to uh, do arbitrage between Mt. Gox. There you go. But uh, right now, uh, BTCE doesn't accept dollars OK pay, which is what most, most people do. Right, so the, the disparity in price exactly covers the cost. No free lunch. What is the relevancy of the opening and closing price on a 24-7 market? There isn't one, hmm. which is why I'm not looking at them. Yeah. Personally, I like to look at individual trades because they just stream in. You might want to look at hour of the day. It seems like most of the volume tends to revolve around sort of 9 a.m. New York time to sort of midnight Los Angeles time because most people trading are U.S. based. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that'll change. Okay. Uh, I also wanted to ask, uh, have you tried doing any data correlations from other sources besides trading like a uh, number of forum posts or Google searches, et cetera? I have not, and that's an excellent idea. One thing I saw on the forum, somebody was trying to value Bitcoins as a function of the current difficulty factor. And there actually does seem to be a pretty strong relationship, which would make sense. As it's more difficult, the cost of electricity to mine goes up, so the price of Bitcoin should go up. So there's some stuff there. Um, do you think there's a, a way to create an aggregate price that, that would be a better representative for people trying to trade Bitcoin outside of the exchanges? Aggregate of what? Um, I don't know, like a basket of the exchanges, or is, is there any way? What, what do you think would be a good way to value? Like, let's say if I'm doing a trade with, with another individual and it's a large size trade, mm -hmm. and I want to price that trade, what's my price discovery mechanism for that? 
you, you could consider an aggregate price, although you have to take into effect all the different percentages and fees. Right now, I think the exchanges are a little too greedy and everyone's charging too big a fee, so that's what hurts that. Now, an aggregate across different cryptocurrencies would be really interesting. You could then make a basket and trade an index on that basket, and that might smooth out some of the noise, depending on the correlation. Okay. Great, I think uh, that wraps it up. I'll be here for a few minutes if anybody wants to talk, chat. Thank you. Thank you.